Hello and welcome to St Luke's and Christ Church, Chelsea. Thank you for joining us for this act of worship. If you find it helpful, then please feel free to pass it on to others. The Lord be with you. Jesus tells the parable of the workers in the vineyard. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and he spent, sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to to the marketplace at nine o'clock and he saw some men standing there doing nothing so he told them you also go and work in the vineyard and i will pay you a fair wage so they went then at 12 o'clock and again at three o'clock did the same thing it was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men who were standing there. He asked them, Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing? They answered, No one hired us. But then you also go and work in the vineyard. Well, when evening came, the owner called his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more, but they too were given a silver coin each. They took them, their money and started grumbling against the employer. They said, These men who were hired last worked only one hour, while we put up with the whole day's work in the hot sun. Yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do all your day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who is why I laughed as much as I have given you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? So those who are last will be picked will be first and those who are first will be last.
May I speak and may we hear in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The most recent figures for our borough show 6,120 registered unemployment, unemployed persons seeking work. The vast majority of them, men between the ages of 25 and 49. And in this parish we were recently approached by a local councillor to see whether we might be able to contribute to issues of food security by establishing a food club, a type of food bank because councillors locally fear that the termination of the furlough scheme may bring the figure of unemployed persons in Arbera to 10,000 or over by Christmas. Unemployment, with all its ramifications for self-worth, income generation, family security and community cohesion, is as relevant a factor for people of faith today as it was in the gospel we just heard. Jesus was using an example, as he so often did, based upon the lived experience of the community he knew, where the dangers of unemployment were as real then as they are now, but in which even the most basic safety net was not present. Employment, work, is a key element in the creation narrative in Genesis, in tending the earth, stewarding creation, providing for family and community need. And the absence of such meaningful work flies in the face of the divine provision for creation. So Jesus tells a story, which with our pragmatic ears sounds unfair, wasteful, even unjust. How can it be that those who have sweated all day in the vineyard, in the heat of the sun, end up with the same daily wage as those who work only two hours or one hour after having stood in the unemployed queue? This singularly fails to meet the reasonableness test, surely. And this story is rooted in another story we know well, the Jonah story. Remember Jonah beside himself with anger. First, he tries to hide from God by running away from the challenge God sets him. But in this almost Alice in Wonderland story, the whale becomes the instrument of Jonah's compulsion to face up to facts. And he goes to Nineveh, the capital city of the country that had destroyed Israel and carried its people into captivity. And irony upon irony, when Jonah does go into that city and preaches repentance, telling the people to turn towards God, they do. God shows mercy and not judgment. And Jonah is furious. He wanted them to face their just deserts. He wanted God to teach them a lesson, but not this one. So he goes off in a huge sulk and sits under a booth to avoid the scorching sun. Jonah is behaving exactly like many religious people down the ages have, who think they have an exclusive claim on God. People who are distressed by the fact that God may show mercy, not only to them, but to their neighbours, or their in-laws, or their colleagues, or, God forbid, even the unemployed who clearly don't deserve it. So depressing is this idea that God shows mercy to a penitent people, that Jonah asks God to make an ending of it all for him. This is the reaction of the sulking child, the child who can't cope with what its emotions are saying. And it's exactly true of the workers in the vineyard too. Just as Jonah reckons that God in his mercy and forgiveness, in his generous acceptance, in his love, cheapens himself, so are we also drawn into this parable's dramatic conclusion. But not on the divine side of the equation, no, on the human side. Our thoughts are understandably about how it's not fair that some work and others don't. Some work much harder than others or longer. 
Some get off lightly while others struggle. After all, who's going to work all day long if you can just turn up at the last minute and get the same pay? It's just not fair. And it isn't. That's the point. The former chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, in his book, The Dignity of Difference, argues powerfully that we, as people of faith, need to move on from the language of rights and entitlement. For that way, we are trapped into these critical, self-righteous ways of thinking, just like Jonah, like the labourers who've worked all day. We're trapped into notions of human fairness. We need, Sachs argues, to move to a different language, a language of covenant and forgiveness, God's language. We need to find the end of the rainbow, yes, but not for the pot of gold, but to realise God's promise to all humanity through that rainbow, that there is a covenant between God and humankind, which is about a turning and asking for forgiveness and the assurance that such forgiveness, new life, new start, is not only possible, but is promised. A rainbow which arcs between God and humanity in kaleidoscopic glory. Rooted in this, know first how much I, you, are forgiven, and live out that forgiveness for all God's children. For we cannot plead covenant mercy for ourselves, and cold justice for others. No one is shortchanged in these stories. Jonah is fulfilled in converting a great city towards a new dependence upon God. The workers in the vineyard all receive payment from God. This is amazing grace, not what I have earned. The story of God's love, God's grace, is offensive precisely because we only view it through our own vision of individual merit. I studied hard to get where I am. I worked my socks off to get to this point of comfort or to buy this house. That may well be true, but it just isn't God's way. God's way is of grace, which perhaps through the stories of Jonah and the workers in the vineyard, we right now realise is not sentimental, never saccharine, but is at the just heart of a forgiving creator. And at that heart is where we need to be. Amen. Let us pray. Those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. 
We remember that God values people who the world often forgets. And we ask that we can be the eyes and ears of God in this world. Help us to know God's love for us and show that love to those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, give wisdom to our bishops and our clergy. Strengthen our church wardens and PCC. Support Anna. Help us all to be faithful workers in God's vineyard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help our leaders, doctors and nurses as they face the challenge of the coronavirus. Help them to make wise decisions and treat the sick with love and care. Protect us and those we love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are sick in body, mind or spirit, asking that they may feel your healing and comforting presence with them. We pray especially for Ian Fraser, Ian Lowe, Neil Buckingham, Sister Margaret and Louise Cummings. Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have gone ahead of us into the joy of our heavenly kingdom. Claire Brutus, Jennifer Scott, Ema Gerard, Edith Delisle. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Right. May we know the generosity of God this week and always. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as Jesus taught us, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.